moment in our Lenten sermon series is the most personal of the bunch for me. Jay Mantal and Abby Mohopt are uh, two of my client heroes. And when I decided to include them in the series on the saints, I didn't realize I was going to need to include a third of my client heroes, Bill McKibben. The thing is, Bill has had an important influence on Jim and on Abby and on me. And so I'm going to start by talking about him for a few minutes. Bill and I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. Bill was a year ahead of me in school, and we went to different junior highs, but still we managed to overlap. We both gave tours of the historic Lexington Battle Green when we were in junior high. And so we were in church youth group together, though I was a little more involved than he was. We were the prime organizers of local protests against Jimmy Carter's reinstitution of draft registration the summer after my first year of college. Bill had completed his second year at Harvard when we gathered on the Lexington Battle Green on a weekly basis to protest, an appropriate spot if there ever was one to lodge a protest against the government. When he graduated from Harvard, Bill got a job writing for the New Yorker magazine, and I didn't hear from him again until I heard him on the radio in 1989 while he was on book tour for his book, The End of Nature. This was the first book published in the United States for a general audience about global warming. He'd done the research to see just what a danger human beings were putting ourselves into by changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. I wish I could tell you that Bill's book alerted me to the dangers posed by global warming. It and some articles he wrote from various journals and magazines started to build my awareness, but it really wasn't until Al Gore's 2006 film, An Inconvenient Truth, that I was truly converted. I don't know how I managed to almost immediately see the connections as clearly as I did, but somehow I saw that as we warmed the planet, weather patterns were going to shift, which was going to make where food could be grown and where water was going to fall shift, which was going to make famines and mass migrations necessary, which was likely going to cause war. People starving, people forced to leave their homes, people taking up arms against each other. These are moral issues, and that is why for over a decade I have called climate change the moral issue of our day. The end of nature impacted Jim Antal as well, though he was aware of the dangers of climate change before Bill published his book. Jim is the recently retired conference minister of the Massachusetts Conference of the United Church of Christ. I think the first time he and I met face to face was at a general synod the every two-year meeting of people across the United Church of Christ gathered some place or other, usually because it's almost always in early July, it's some place that's humid and hot because the hotel rates are a little bit lower that time of year. And so we gathered uh, that particular year where we worship, well, with every general synod, we worship and we eat and we learn and the delegates passed resolutions. And one of the resolutions that particular uh, synod was a call for the various settings of the United Church of Christ to divest from fossil fuels. It turned out that Jim was a champion of that resolution and that resolution was the one that was most important to me at that synod. Jim traces his journey uh, to um, his journey to being one of the strongest voices in the UCC about climate change back to uh, a road trip that he took with his father when he was 15. Jim's parents had divorced and he moved to California to live with his father. That summer they did a tour of national parks out here in the western United States as a way to get reacquainted with each other. And Jim fell in love with the outdoors. Over the next two summers he hiked the John Muir Trail. 
He went off to college, and while he was there, he organized his campus's celebration of the first Earth Day. Jim reminded me that the first Earth Day was organized by a Republican senator as a cross-country teach-in, and that 10% of Americans participated. Jim's father, the man that took Jim on that national park tour that made him fall in love with the outdoors and led him to his passion for environmental ethics, worked in the fossil fuel industry. He was a chemical engineer for mobile oil. Jim's brother followed in their father's footsteps into the sciences and is, in the world, is a world export, uh, expert in charcoal. Though Jim didn't pursue a science as a career, the exposure to science and scientific thinking caused Jim to pay attention to Carl Sagan's writings about global warming in the 1970s. And Jim paid attention when NASA scientist James Hansen testified before Congress about the dangers of global warming in 1988. And that's when he started preaching about climate change. The next year, Bill's book, The End of Nature, came out, and that strengthened Jim's commitment to te preaching and teaching about climate change. Jim describes himself as a big picture thinker. I take in the whole things first and then the details. The greenhouse effect started getting talked about and I saw the whole picture and the threat to the earth, he told me. When I asked Jim to expand on that threat, he said, God provided humanity with sufficient freedom that we can extinguish life as God created it. Jim suggested that I check the United Nations website and the web pages, particularly about population and climate change and see how they were intersecting with each other. Jim told me that if we don't do anything about climate change sometime between 2045 and 2070, the world's human population will plummet because of water and food shortages, wars, and massive refugee movements, we will go from 9 billion people to 2 billion people. What are the theological implications of living in a world where the gift of nature is good for only a quarter of the people of the earth? Jim asked me that rhetorically. In one or two generations, he said, when three of four people are dying off, the theological implications are infinite. If we're not preaching once a month on climate change, in a couple generations, every sermon we preach will be on grief. Imagine a world where the earth is no longer friendly to life as we've known it. Abby Mohopt also sees the grave dangers of climate change, the change, uh, dangers that they are posing to humanity and to the rest of creation. Abby and I met in Richmond on August 3rd, 2013. That's where we met there. That's, we were protesting at the Chevron refinery and Bill McKibben had something to do with our presence. For several years, Jim had been calling for upper middle class white folk to start engaging in civil disobedience to protest the fossil fuel industry. Why upper middle class white folk? Because we have the most privilege when it comes to the criminal justice system. Well, Abby isn't middle-aged, but she responded to the call anyway. I won't go into what happened that day. You can read about it in the sermon that I preached the next day. It's on my blog. I'll have a, post, a link to it when I put this sermon up on my blog. Abby started reflecting on ecology and theology in broad strokes when she was in seminary, both where the earth is hurting and where the earth brings joy. When she did her internship at First Presbyterian Church of Palo Alto, she was assigned to staff their ecology group, and during that year, Bill McKibben was on a cross-country bus tour. It was called the Do the Math Tour, and it was calling on people like you and me to organize institutions 
like churches and pension funds and cities, to organize institutions and ourselves to divest from fossil fuels. Abby took 20 people from her church to the Palo Alto tour stop that got her interested in divestment, and she is now a leader in getting the Presbyterian Church USA to divest from fossil fuels. In addition to organizing her denomination and organizing seminaries to divest, Abby is working on her PhD dissertation on feminist and womenist theology, climate change, and environmental racism. But this isn't just an academic issue for Abby. She lives in Pescadero. I live near the ocean now, she told me. So when I hear stories about the oceans rising, it's the ocean I live next to, the ocean that I love, that will take over the land where I live now. It's real. It's very real. I asked Abby and Jim what they do to keep hoping in the midst of this reality, this very real reality. Jim told me, every morning, my first thought is gratitude. Having this big picture, I'm just astonished that there is such a thing as life. I wake up in the morning and think, oh my God, there's such a thing as life, and I can bear witness to truth today. That's why I can be dedicated to what can otherwise be depressing work. He also told me that over the course of his career, he has had a theological shift from concern about personal salvation to concern about collective salvation. He noted that he is hardly the first person to talk about this shift. He pointed me to the works of Richard Rohr and Teilhard de Chardin. Jim said, I don't spend conscious time thinking about my personal salvation, but of humanity standing before God, having set the stage of wrecking God's creation. That's why Jim has been an activist in his ministry and continues to be an activist in retirement. When consciousness and all that is around you is infused with God, he said, that naturally leads to activism if it turns out that you're living on the hinge of history when the very creation is in jeopardy. Presbyterianism comes out of Calvinism, which can have a bit of a focus on the depravity of humanity. Abby said, everything we do has a taint of sin in it. Everything we do as a carbon footprint. This has led me to a place of confession. We need each other, and we need God to make a way. She went on, when we understand everything we do has a carbon footprint, we can't be in judgment of each other's carbon footprint. We need to be open to God's grace, which helps us understand and face the reality of climate change. This, in this reality of climate chaos, where everything we do adds to the chaos, we can be overwhelmed or we can turn into God's grace, which will give me courage and humility to respond to the reality of climate change. Every time I try to make my carbon footprint smaller, I try to think about how this impacts my relationship with God, with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. The closer I feel to the earth, the closer I feel to God. If I'm right, and I think I am, that climate change is the moral issue of our day. We need saints like Jim Antal and Abby Mohopt to help us find our way, a way that includes protest and activism and political lobbying, and a way that includes confession and community and spiritual grounding. Amen.